what I'm going to do is I'm going to record it, but then after I record it, I'm going to post it on my YouTube channel. And um, I know they want us to post it on this university YouTube channel, but I started months and months ago recording my videos before we had the university YouTube channel. So I started putting them on my personal channel and I didn't want to put them in two different places because I was afraid that might confuse people. Um, so um, uh, I'll, let me try to tell you everything and then we'll see if you guys have any questions. First of all, I want to uh, uh, I want to help everybody learn a little bit about uh, doing some things on the computer uh, that you might not know very well. It's not my intention to be uh, uh, very difficult and, and give you bad grades. I mean, uh, a, a long time ago, um, many, many years ago, back when the rector was my student, um, uh, I was just really a hard professor. And, um, and over the years, I kind of discovered that be, being very, very hard and very demanding uh, didn't really help students learn the material any better. And uh, so uh, I really focus on trying to help people learn the material. And I understand that on different subjects, people understand things at different levels. Some things you understand better than others and so on. So it's not my intention to give anybody a bad grade unless they just give up on the course. And so I, I want you to focus on trying to learn things as well as you can. And, uh, and if you do that, uh, I think the grades should be just fine. Um, and um, my during my first year at UCA, uh, I gave mostly A's. And um, so, um, you know, it doesn't mean that for sure you'll get an A, but I, I don't want you to be too terribly worried about how you're going to do. Um, now, so let me go over my syllabus because the syllabus is actually important for the course. And um, I'll go over the syllabus and and then depending on how much time we have left, uh, I'm going to go through an example. So uh, let me share my screen now. Okay. It, uh, looks to me like you can probably all see my screen. If you can't uh, yell out. Um, OK. So I uh, I made up um, a name for the course when I first proposed it. I first called it computer science for poets. And I and I actually I didn't mean it exactly as computer science for poets. I meant it as computer science for people who are not big on computer science. And um, and somebody said, well, they thought computer science for poets was too narrow. So I added artists. And actually, the artists might be more uh, important than the poets, because later on in the course, when we're looking at the processing software, um, we'll be writing little pieces of computer code that do graphics. And um, so uh, that's why artists might be more uh, applicable than poets here. OK, the first half of the course. I'm going to talk about Microsoft Excel. And um, I'm talking about Excel because Excel is an extremely powerful piece of software that most people have heard about, and they may have used it a little bit, 
but they really don't have a good idea on how powerful it, Excel is and how many things you can do with it. Um, the biggest problem I have always had with Excel is that uh, it's sometimes is difficult to figure out how to do what you want to do. And uh, so uh, if anything you should learn here as we talk about Excel is if you don't know how to do something, how to find the explanation of how you should do it. And uh, so the first half of the course is on Excel. Uh, second half of the course is on this computer language called processing. And processing was explicitly designed for people who are in electronic arts, new media art, and visual design communities. And it, it's out of MIT, specifically designed for people who are artistically inclined. And um, I first started doing processing, I don't know, maybe about six years ago, maybe longer. Um, I was trying to figure out how to teach um, computer programming to students uh, in high school and middle school. I, I don't know if you know anything about my background. Maybe I should tell you that a little bit. Um, I um, uh, I won't go all the way back to the beginning. I say I was a professor at Purdue for 18 years, although I was a professor at a place before that. And um, then uh, I became the, uh, the chair of electrical and computer engineering at the University of Delaware, which as I was mentioning earlier, that's where I ran into Joe Biden, the one of the candidates for U.S. president now. And uh, then I became uh, dean of engineering at Colorado State University. And then I became dean of engineering and computer science at the University of Central Florida. Um, then I retired. I was in, got in my mid-60s and I retired from that. And then I started uh, high school in middle school for gifted uh, kids, for gifted children. And uh, and that school's still operating today. And um, I taught most of the math, uh, science, and computer courses in the high school, actually. And uh, I, uh, the reason why I founded the high school is my two youngest kids we're in the Florida public schools here where I live in the state of Florida. And I really wasn't happy with the Florida public schools. And I thought, well, I can complain about it the way everybody does. Or education is something that I understand. So I can complain about it or I can do something. So I decided to do something, which is how I founded the, got involved with starting that high school. And that's an interesting story, and maybe I'll tell you that someday about how uh, I started that high school. And I was at the high school for a long time, I don't know, maybe seven years. And then my two youngest kids uh, graduated. You know one, maybe, my daughter Mara, who was with me there at UCA. And um, so, uh, so I... Uh, and I had been in uh, Kyrgyzstan, oh, I don't know, about 37 years ago, um, back when the capital was called Frunza, and it was part of the Soviet Union. And um, I was invited by Askar Akayev um, because he and I had similar research interest and we had published and worked in similar areas and uh, I got invited to uh, to Kyrgyzstan by uh, Akayev and was there with a few other people um, and uh, I was I really uh, enjoyed 
Central Asia. And uh, so, and, and then, you know, then I came back to the States and I led my life there for a while. And then a couple of years ago, I saw that a, a former PhD student of mine, Sohel Nakvi, the rector, had just moved to Bishkek. Now, unlike most Americans, I knew what Bishkek was because I had been there before. And uh, so I, he, we were friends on Facebook. So I sent him a, a, a message on Facebook and said, what in the hell are you doing in Bishkek? And uh, so he explained to me about UCA and whatever. And this was happening about the same time that Mara was in her senior year in high school. And I think it's very important um, for people to have experience with other cultures and other countries. And um, so I thought, well, this was a chance perhaps, uh, because when I looked at the UCA website, in particularly in computer science, at the time I saw while they, there was a major in computer science, there was only one professor in computer science. So I uh, sent uh, the rector a message and I said, look, I, I see you need computer science faculty. Suppose I come there for a year and teach and bring my daughter. And he said, sounds like a great idea. So that's how I ended up there with Mara. And um, so, uh, I, again, I, I could go into some more details, but unless somebody has a specific question about things, I, I think uh, I, I think that's more than enough. Um, so now back here on the course, there is a, a textbook. I have a PDF of the textbook, and I posted it on. I guess it's not Moodle anymore. Uh, I, I don't know what it's called, but I posted it there, and. Um, I uh, so if you for, are having a problem uh, getting it off of that website, I can I can try to email it to you. And um, so I'll skip the student learning outcome because these are things I just make up to make the bureaucracy happy. Um, you know, what we end up covering is going to depend, you know, a lot on, on how well you guys are doing and how you understand the material and if you have any special questions or interest. The academic integrity thing, that's also, as we call it, boilerplate. It's just things we're expected to put in there. Um, and I don't, you can work with other students on doing homework and doing things that I'm okay with that because when you do that, you learn. If you just just copy what somebody else gives you without trying to understand it though, you're the one that loses on that um, because um, like I said, I, you know, I, I try to give everybody a good grade anyway. So the only thing you'll lose by copying things is you'll lose understanding probably it won't hurt your grade. Um, I will, am assigning homework thing, homework to do every week. And um, so I want you to give it a shot, do your best. And, you know, if you have problems, let me know what your problems are. And then I can talk about them. And um, so this is a grading policy I've used before. Um, like you know, every homework, I'll, I'll give it a grade of five or four, a grade from, let's say, one to five. And, you know, five is excellent, four very good, three good. If um, you don't get at least a three, I'm going to ask you to do it over again. And, uh, and a, a grade of three would qualify for a B. Um, and actually a grade of four or five gives you an A. So if you don't get at least a B on the homework, I ask you to do over again. 
which means that by the, and I do this with all the grades. I haven't completely decided if I'm going to do a midterm or a final in the normal sense. Um, last last class I taught, um, I didn't give a midterm because the semester was screwed up. And but I did give a final, but it was a take home final. And I, I gave people uh, the final, gave them a week to do it. And it was open notes and open everything and everybody did fine. Um, so let's see weekly schedule. I hope I may not have corrected all the times here because when I first set this up. Uh, my class was scheduled at a different time. Now the syllabus. Say we're starting week one here. And I, what I have is I give a little description of what I hope to cover in that week. So the week one, the first two classes, and um, I have videos. As I said, the videos are recorded on my YouTube channel. And this is where really the material is on the course. I recorded all these videos over the past several months. And um, so these are videos. I don't I don't think any of them are larger longer than 20 minutes, but we'll see. Um, and uh, so you can look at these videos and what I like about giving you the videos is if there's something you don't understand or you miss, you can go back and look at it. And if you still don't understand it, you can ask me a question, send me an email, do whatever to you know get in touch with me, and I'm really happy to help. So this is for this week. Now I have assigned homework. Now, if we if you go down toward the middle of the syllabus, I have my homework assignments right here, and I talk a little bit about the homeworks. And um, so for this week. I have one video I want you to look at and I want you to try to do this assignment. And um, the, now what's different about this assignment even than all the other assignments in this assignment, I'm asking you to look at something that I'm not sure that you w would understand how to do. And part of what I'm trying to determine is how skilled you are at going online and finding things. And um, I'm going to tell you this because it's worked for me is that whenever I don't know how to do anything on uh, about anything, when I don't know how to do anything about anything, I look for a YouTube video on it. And uh, YouTube is just chock full of things. So I go into YouTube and I'll search. I type in a question and I search. And usually several videos will come up explaining how to do something. I like it better than Google is Google gives you a lot of web pages. I find watching the videos on YouTube easier to understand than trying to read web pages. Uh, uh, about something, but you between YouTube and Google. Almost without exception on any subject, I can learn how to do something. I've fixed water heaters and garbage disposals, appliances around my home by finding videos on YouTube. So. Um, that is uh, an important skill that you need to to get good at. Now, not everybody's good at it because you, if you've done any searching around on YouTube, you know you can change the wording of the question and you get different results. So you might ask a question one way and you don't see anything. You just change the wording a little bit and all of a sudden a, a bunch of solutions to your problem comes up. So I have Week by week, I have a list of videos here on my 
uh, YouTube channel. Let me just click one. You should you should be able to click click them on here and uh, open link. I want to cover importing. Okay, there's me. You see that? And uh, I was I'm doing a lesson on trying to figure out how gravity works by actually using this video here um, and uh, and setting up an Excel sheet. So that is what this uh, this is about. That's me, handsome and smart. Okay. And the idea is to... Okay, come on. So these are all... They should all be clickable right on the uh, PDF for the course syllabus. So you'll have to, and on, most probably on a regular basis, I will be updating the course syllabus and I will try to email you an updated course syllabus and then change the posted syllabus on um, uh, on the alternative, the new alternative to Moodle now. Uh, so you will... From time to time, you'll be getting an update on this as I might change it. Um, I guess we're still scheduled for a midterm break. I guess that was up in the air for a while, whether we we're going to do a midterm break or not. And uh, But I think we are. So I'm going to do Excel right up to the midterm break. Now, one thing I want you to be aware here is... Um, I don't know how well this is going to work, but I thought I would give it a shot because you guys in comms and media, uh, I guess you're supposed to be learning, you know, how to uh, how to write news stories and do things like that. And um, it can really be helpful to understand how to interpret data that's presented, because um, if uh, if the people making the news are like Trump. They make up their own data, make up their own facts. Um, and um, so I've uh, given a sort of little mini project here, in addition to doing these homeworks, where I give you a link to a website out of Europe, a medical website where they have all the worldwide data on COVID infections. So I give you that link and I want you to look in there and look at all this data and just do something with it. And uh, I give you some suggestions. For example, look at how the virus has um, developed in South America versus the uh, post-Soviet states like Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan. So, you know, just I'm just offering that as a suggestion. How has the virus developed in these different uh, geographical regions? So it's not intended to be, you know, extremely uh, difficult. It can be as difficult and interesting as you want to make it, I'm just trying to give you some data so that you can take that data and do something with it in Excel. So we'll see how, you know, I, I, I'm curious to see what you guys do with it. Um, and um, so uh, at the midterm break, we're done with the Excel part of the course. Then it changes. We start doing processing after the midterm break. And again, I have posted videos on processing. And um, with processing, it's a uh, real. It's it's actually. I think it's. I think it's pretty straightforward and easy to use, especially if you're reading this textbook. And I'm going to go over the textbook, chapter by chapter, section by section, getting started with processing starting at the beginning pretty much. And uh, we're going to be doing simple things. And I describe how to do these simple things in these videos. And um, 
So we do that until about the end of the course. And I've left a little space at the end where I can either fill it in with more processing or I can go back and answer questions that people may have. And um, and then possibly on the last week of classes, I will give you a take home final uh, with some questions about things that we have done in here. And often the questions on my final are exactly the same as homework questions I have asked. So that's a reason to do the homework. So here's the final sections of the homework where I ask you to run pieces of code, uh, try to figure out how to draw some shapes um, and things like that. And uh, like I said, often my final questions are just right out of these homeworks. So if you've done the homeworks, you're set for doing the final. Like I said, I'm not trying to make it overly difficult. I'm just, I just want you to, to learn as much as you can. Okay. Um, there's probably a lot more for me to say, but I might stop here. See if anybody have, have any questions so far. No, everything is clear. Okay. Well, I, I, uh, I'm glad about that. If you have any questions, you know, you guys know how to email me. And uh, OK, so I thought I'd start um, and I'd give an example uh, of uh, using Excel. And uh, you know, this could be a mistake, what I'm going to do right now. I if one of the things you'll learn with me here is that I make lots and lots of mistakes. And uh, and I'm always trying to figure out different ways of doing things. And in particular, here, let me, let me, I've opened up Excel here. Let me pull it over. Here, right here. And I'm assuming you all actually have Excel on your university laptops. And um, so um, I figure what, what I'm going to try to do is uh, rather than start off with something really simple, I'm going to start off solving a typical problem that you might come across and use Excel for. And um, because today, as uh, for me, as I learn new things, I'm usually not learning things by going through a step-by-step -step tutorial. Usually there's something very special that I want to do, and I want to learn how to do that one thing. So that's how I learn things today. I'm not saying that's the best way to do it. That's just the way I do it. If you get a job and you go out and you're working, and all of a sudden you realize, gee, I need to understand how to do this, uh, you're not interested in learning everything in the world about how to do that. You're only interested in learning that one thing. So, for example, if you're writing a survey article on the history of post Mao China, you're not interested in the entire history of China. You're only interested in the history of China after Mao. So, you know, that's sort of the logic here, good or bad. So let me show you what I'm what I want to try to do here with this example. And then I will go through step by step um, you know, how to do it, how to look at it. And, and as you come across things that you don't know how to do, how you might figure out how to do it. Figuring out how to do things that you don't understand is the single most important skill that you can have because things are changing so quickly in the world today that just in a few years most of what you have learned will have changed uh, or most of what you will need to know will have changed 
So you have to know how to learn things on your own. And um, I, unfortunately, many professors don't do that. I can tell you, you know, throughout my life and throughout my career, I've known many professors who have never done anything new past their PhD dissertation. And they just keep doing the same thing over and over and over again, which is, I, I think, is regrettable. And that because almost nothing that I do anymore or teach anymore has anything to do with anything that I learned when I was in school. Okay, so now let me let me pull up. I did this a few months ago, and I want to try to redo it again. Okay, melting point graph. And I did this, actually, uh, like I said, it was quite a while ago. And uh, my daughter, Mar, was taking a chemistry course. And she didn't know how to use Excel very well. And she had a homework problem in chemistry uh, to plot a graph for the melting point of, um, of, of a list of elements. And so um, I did this with her to show her how to use Excel to do that homework problem. And um, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to say, let me just, I'm going to take this and copy it. Now, what I do in Excel is I click on the cell, then I go to the extreme other end of the so I want to copy this whole section here. So I go down here and I do shift and click. And that copies that whole thing. And so let me just move this aside and let me put it. I want to put it here. So I click on this. Then I uh, on my I'm using a Mac and uh, but I use the paste command. And it's not pasting there. I don't know if. Uh, this is, let me just try here. This, I'm going to copy right in here. If it, do, if it doesn't work here, I will, um, there, let me try it again. There we go. Now notice I can make the columns wider. I go click on the top here. And I can slide the and change the width of the columns. OK, so I have the, these are the elements If you guys vaguely remember chemistry. Uh, these are the elements down the first column in the periodic table. Lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, cesium and francium. And um, and then I have plotted the atomic mass, which is also on the periodic table, for each element. So I this is I got this all off the periodic table because Mara was asked to find patterns between the melting points of elements. So then I went, um, believe it or not, I used Google, and I found the melting points for each one of these elements here. And this is in uh, degrees Celsius. And then the question is, is there a pattern relating the atomic mass and the melting point? And this is exactly the thing that Excel is really good at, is doing something like this. And so let me just show you um, how I started this. And then when I come across something that I'm not sure about, I Google it or look on YouTube or whatever to see if I can find an explanation. So I'm going to click here on this atomic mass, and then I shift click here on that. So I copy all the data in, in, in these two columns right here. All I want to do is make a graph of that data. Now, it turns out 
that if I want to make a graph in Excel, the, all the graphing stuff, see these are tabs up here. And this whole thing on Excel is called the ribbon. And you can pull up different ribbons. Here, this is a different ribbon. And insert. And here is where they have the graphs. They call them recommended charts or and then not so recommended charts. Now let's let's see here. I go here and I want to do a uh, let's say right here. Let me go scatter with straight lines. Let me try this. There, look at that. So here is a chart right there, and I can make it bigger by drawing, by pulling down on the corner here. Well, this is interesting. I mean, it's not a straight line graph, that's for sure. Now, I can add labels, because notice in the chart I showed you a few minutes ago, here I've got labels. I've got melting point, atomic mass, a title for the chart, I have an equation. So these are all nice things you can put on a chart that make it clear for someone else that might be reading it. So this is perhaps a, you know, a, a first lesson is that often when you're using Excel or spreadsheet, um, you're trying to make something to show to someone else not necessarily use for yourself. Whenever you're making something to show it to your boss or you're trying to convince someone else of something um, and you want to make a chart, you need to label the chart so that it is self-explanatory. If you don't do that, people just look at this. They don't know what it is, right? What are you plotting versus what and so on? So I... Today, I'll probably get to some of this stuff, but um, I can click on chart title and I can I can now then add a chart title. So I click on that and I just add, let me just call it melting point. Like that. And um, now something, if you don't already know it, is that, especially with Microsoft stuff, but I have found it's true with most software, is that you can pull up um, menus of things by right-clicking. So, for example, if I want to know, I, here I want to do something with this graph. And what I might want to do is figure out what is the equation of that graph, for example. I can go on, I put my mouse on the graph and I right click. And I have a whole bunch of stuff here. Format data series, add trend line, add data labels, all sorts of things. And, and you can go in here and experiment with some of these things. But right now, I want to add a trend line. I want to see if I can figure out what is the equation of that line. Is there an equation that makes any sense at all? So there. And the, automatically, the first thing that it does is it adds, it does the best straight line fit to the data. Well, as you can see, this isn't much of a straight line. So the straight line fit to the data isn't very good. Well, I have choices of what kind of line I might graph. But now, down here, this is useful. See here it says display equation on chart. Now I like to do that because I, when I generally, when I'm doing a plot, I'm trying to learn the relationship between what's on the X axis and what's on the Y axis. And I get that by doing this display equation on chart. Now, if this were a straight line, if this data were on a straight line, this would pretty much track that straight line. And when I display the equation right down here, let me click on this and drag it up so I can see it there. Now, for me, this is too small to read. 
So I have this. So how can I make this bigger? Well, most Microsoft software on the home, this is true in Word, for example, is that I can set the size of the font that I'm using. And in particular, this is font size nine. Let me see what happens if I go to 14. Now, okay, it only did that one number. Let me try to select everything in here and then do it again. I'll do 12 and then I'll do, let's go 16. So there, that's a little bit better. I'll go even bigger. I don't know what you can see at home um, or wherever you're at. Okay, so there's the equation. So this is the equation for this line, okay? But uh, I don't know, it's uh, not particularly, since the line doesn't fit the data, it's not particularly helpful. Now, let me go back, bring up that add trend line again, because it disappeared on me. Now I can choose different, um, different kinds of curves. So I could go exponential, that doesn't seem very good. Back to linear logarithmic. Hey, that's better logarithmic. Polynomial. Wait, I'm turning off the there. Let's try polynomial. There's polynomial power. Look at that. This power graph really fits that well. So this might indeed describe the equation, uh, that power. Now, but I have to figure out what that equation is after, you know, this isn't quite enough for me. And um, so uh, let me, uh, let me get rid of that straight line because I'm not using that for sure. Okay, now I'm here format trend line, and let's see if I display equation. Here we go, right here, I can't read it. So I select everything, go to a larger font. There we go. So this is the equation there that does a pretty good job of fitting that data. Now, I, you know, if I were a chemist, I might be able to go back and figure out if that equation is telling me anything about the mysteries of the universe. Now, um, let's see if there's something else I might be able to show you. Um, let me click on here. I'm going to click on right down at the bottom here where those numbers are. See that right there, down there. Let me make this a little bit bigger. Hey, I didn't want to do that. Hey. Okay, I may be a little bit smaller here. Okay, there. Now this bottom here where these numbers are, so uh, let me click on this. Let me right click. Right click, format chart area. I, I don't, I'm on a format. Format axis. So I right click down there, I do format axis. Now, let's see if this is what I'm looking for. What I want to do, you may have covered this in uh, pre calculus, is how to draw graphs with a logarithmic scale. So that's what I want to do here. So instead of plotting this linear data down here, I'm plotting the log of that data. So whatever I had down here before, I'm now plotting the log. And then I'm going to do the same thing up here. I'm doing this because I, I know what the answer is. Now, format axis. Seems I, I don't know, may have lost that here.
and let me um, do logarithmic there. Now look at this. I make this a log scale and I make this log scale and then the line of the plot is almost perfectly linear. And this is the equation right up here. This is the equation, if it's not on a log plot, this is the equation of the data. Now, if you take the log of both sides, and this isn't a course on algebra or whatever, but if you take the log of y and take the log of the right side, you'll get something that looks like a straight line. Uh, and um, so, like I said, this isn't a course on pre-calculus or, or, or whatever, but I'm just trying to show you, give you some idea of the kinds of things that you can do. Now this, the fact that I get a straight line on a log-log plot, this is very important to the chemist. This is telling the chemist something important about the relationship between melting point and atomic mass. Okay, now let's go back to the uh, to the data, uh, to the problem I, I presented to you in the homeworks over the next few weeks. Now, this is you have to do this over the next few weeks. You don't have to do it for next week, exactly. That's the looking at the the COVID virus data. But if you go in and look to that, you just pick one country. It might be interesting to plot, let's say, the week by week data of a country and see what curves fit it over particular periods of time. And um, if you're an, an epidemiologist, that might be giving you some important data. If you're a journalist and you're writing a story, you might look at this data, do a graph, and then you'll say, look at this. We have a polynomial increase in the number of COVID cases, or we have an exponential increase in the number of COVID cases, or we have a logarithmic increase in the number of COVID cases. And then when you see that, you might go to the expert, to the epidemiologist, and ask them, what does this mean? that the data is coming out this way. So even doing you know, a relatively straightforward analysis of the, of the data can inform you in terms of what's going on and what kinds of questions to ask. And, um, but you know, you only, like anything, you only get good at it if you practice it. So this is why I want to, give you some things to practice with. As uh, what I always used to tell my, uh, my students, you know, back when uh, in my previous life, both my high school and university students, I would tell them, I could give you the most brilliant lecture in the world and how to play the piano. And you would not walk out of that lecture being able to play the piano any better. Or make a sports analogy. I could give you uh, a wonderful lecture and I could show you how to shoot free throws in basketball. But at the end of it, you wouldn't be able to shoot a free throw any better than before. You have to get out there and practice. And the only way we learn, and I've said this before, sometimes people disagree with me, but I claim the only way we learn is by doing something, okay? And then we do it again, and we do it again, and we do it again. And neuroscience, in fact, tells us that's the way we learn. And if you do artificial intelligence in a computer program, the way the artificial intelligence works is it just picks random cases and, and checks. Does this work for a problem or not? 
So with artificial intelligence, you just keep picking random cases and you see what works and what doesn't work. And that will guide the next case that you pick. So artificial intelligence in a computer works by practicing. It practices. People learn by practicing. And um, so I, you know, this is, I just want to emphasize this also. The only way you learn anything is by practice. And somewhere in the notes, I say that some of you may find it counterintuitive and it may be exactly against everything you've ever done in school up until now. So I'm, I'm relying on my 45 or 50 years of teaching when I say this, okay? And that is you learn more struggling with the things that you can't do and you don't know how to do and you struggle with it and you try to do it a little bit better and you try and you keep changing and trying to do it a little bit better. You learn more in that process than you learn if you know how to do things perfectly. Because if you already know how to do things perfectly, you're not learning anything. And, um, you know, if you watch a young baby learning how to do things, you know, the youngest babies certainly don't understand what you're saying anyway but they keep practicing. When they're learning how to crawl, they practice and practice and practice. They're learning how to walk, they practice and practice and practice. So it's the way we learn how to do things and it's the way you know, most intelligent mammals learn how to do things, okay? We're either born knowing how to do it or we learn how to do it. And with human beings, unfortunately, we're born with an empty head pretty much, right? Uh, and uh, so we have to practice and practice and practice. So, um, and I actually have this as a homework question in a few weeks, is looking at this data, plotting the graph, labeling the axes, and so on. So I'm giving you a little heads up on it here with this example. And so I didn't do, if you were opening a book on Excel, first thing they would do is, and, we're, and I do this in the videos pretty much, explain what the ribbon is and whatever. And I'll pick up more normal stuff uh, in subsequent lectures. Uh, right now, my plan is to uh, meet with you uh, for the Tuesday lectures once a week. But if either you or I decide that we need to do it more frequently, I will also do the Thursday lectures. I, I don't have a problem with this. Um, and um, so uh, let me uh, uh, let me just ask you that question right now or coming up um for me, I'm coming up on the eight o'clock hour. I, I think the sun has broken the horizon there. And um, so uh, I don't know if my camera, I'll have to see, look at the wire on my camera. I'm not gonna take it off again now, but I could show you out the window here, right next to my table where I'm working. Okay, does, uh, do you think you guys want me to come on Thursday, Thursday? Uh, 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 you know, late afternoon, what, five o'clock in the afternoon, I can do another class on Thursday and we can start, you know, going through from the basics on Excel. So um, who would like me to come on uh, Thursday again? Yeah. I heard one. Um, anybody else? Okay, what I will do is I will set up a, um, I'll set up another uh, Teams uh, video meeting for Thursday. I'll come on on Thursday and you guys come on 
if you uh, uh, you know if you want to. And if we uh, go a couple of weeks and hardly anybody is showing up or nobody is showing up, I, I may stop doing it. But uh, I'll come on again on Thursday. So uh, before though, before I go, uh, let me ask. Here's the other thing, and um, I want people to ask questions. I don't know how you guys are about asking questions. I know a lot of people are afraid to ask questions in class because they're afraid that they look stupid in front of the other students when uh, when they ask a question. And uh, I. Uh, I was probably like that. I might still be like that to some extent. But you 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 really do yourself a favor by asking questions because what another thing I have learned over my you know, 50 years, 45 years of teaching is that often most of the class has exactly the same question and everybody is afraid to ask it. And um, so um, uh, don't be afraid to ask a question um, because the odds are other people will have it and I will not think less of you for asking a question. I will be glad that you're trying to learn the material. And um, so if there's anything you don't understand, ask the question. If you're embarrassed to ask the question in class, um, send me an email with the question and or and then I could make a little video with an answer or you can uh, or we can meet up with a a one on one video. Now what I'm going to do with this lecture today, after Teams, you know, pr processes the video, what I did last semester is I would download the video and I would put it on my YouTube channel. And then when I do that, I will then send out an email. So this probably happened later today. For you, it'll be tonight. You'll probably be in bed, but I will do it and send you the link so you can go back and review this if you feel it's necessary to do it. Um, let me come back uh, here, figure out how to show you my pretty face. Here I am. Okay. Hey, Mabashar, I'm seeing you got back on. I'm glad. Um, and um, Let's see who all is on here. I'm gonna I'm gonna check up on you guys. Okay, so if um, I'm gonna hang up now, are there? Uh, any last minute questions here? No questions. No Thank questions. you for the lesson. Okay, yeah. hey. Okay. hey. Hey guys, I, I'm enjoying having you in class. I hope you learned something out of this. And um, uh, I will be on, uh, for me it's Thursday morning, for you it's Thursday afternoon. So uh, if you want to come on, I'll come on again then at that time. So take care of yourselves. Thank you, you too. Yep. Have a nice day. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. I see.